Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us to hear about an exciting project that took place in the library's preservation department uh, during the 2018-2019 school year. First, our land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And then, how we often begin, we'll do introductions. My name is Mariah Caruso. I'm the library's digital preservation librarian. This means that I help the libraries to ensure that all the digital things we purchase, create, or accept across the tri-campus libraries will continue to be useful and usable for as long as needed. In the case of our archives and special collections, that usually means forever. If you've ever lost an email or had trouble opening an old Microsoft Word document on a new computer, you probably understand some of the challenges of my work. I also manage many of the reformatting or digitization workflows and preservation, primarily for books and paper-based materials, which is how I got involved in this project. I'll let my colleague, Justin Johnson, introduce himself. Thanks, Mariah. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Justin Johnson, the Senior Conservator for Books and Paper, and it is my role to provide treatment and repair for our rare and special collections across the libraries. For this project, I was tasked with not only making repairs where they were needed most, but was also reviewing the condition of each of the selected items to determine their ability to undergo digitization. And even though she isn't speaking today, Erin Connor played such a huge role in the genesis and management of this project, so it would feel incomplete not to include her name here. She's the head of the Music, Art, and Drama Libraries at the University of Washington Libraries. Okay, so that's us. So what are we doing? In the spring of 2018, Anne Graham, a programmer in the library's information technology services and digital strategies, who previously worked on a number of digital projects, and Erin Connor, head of the music libraries, approached me to ask about restarting a project to digitize some of our rare music scores. Over the previous few years, we had been slowly building capacity and preservation for in-house digitization for rare and fragile materials, and thought that this project would be a perfect way to pilot a new way of working for us all, doing high quality standards-based digitization that was then shared as widely as possible while being respectful of the original materials and hopefully the library's bottom line. Led by Erin Cotter, we applied for a collaborative friends grant Friends of the Libraries grant, and were awarded $5,000 to give it a try. Digitization projects help us share our collections widely, making them more easily available for scholars, teachers, and students. Digitization can also be a preservation activity when we make a digital copy that has a very high fidelity to the original, so it can serve as a surrogate for that, job, for that object for nearly all purposes. And since it's a key component of our project, I wanted to take a minute to talk about why we wanted to use the Hathi Trust to present our digitized books. The Hathi Trust preserves and provides access to more than 17 million digitized books, many captured from libraries participating in the Google Books project, part of an ongoing venture by Google to digitize the world. Because academic libraries were wary of relying on a commercial company to steward their valuable content, they formed the trust to safely preserve their copies of the digitized books, to provide free and open access whenever permissible by copyright law, and also they maintain a suite of innovative research tools around the digitized content. Even though the UW libraries were never a Google Books participant, we became a member of the Hathi Trust early on. One of the many benefits of that membership is the ability to deposit our digitized books for preservation and access to the Hathi Trust. So there we were. We had the idea, the funding, equipment, expertise, and a great repository to put our materials in. Now all we had to do was get to work. Here is the basic project life cycle. I'll touch on each step briefly now, and then Justin and I will go into more detail for each one. We began at the top with selection. Aaron selected what to include in our pilot from amongst the amazing, rich, and varied materials held in our rare music collections. For this pilot, we picked items that hadn't been made available digitally in any way before. Following her selection, Justin reviewed each item for conservation concerns and performed treatments where necessary. 
Then a trained student photographed the materials, edited images, and produced the packages of metadata, text, and image files necessary for upload into the Haji Trust, working with both me and preservation and libraries IT with Ann Grin. I checked each package for completeness and accuracy and uploaded in batches to the Hathi Trust, where they are preserved for the long term and are openly accessible to researchers and students around the world. With that context, let's dive a little bit deeper. Erin Connor began by selecting materials from the Rare Music Collection. She primarily focused on our rare piano vocal opera scores that would be of interest to musicians and scholars, and that weren't already digitized by us or another institution. As a professional musician myself, I found the opportunity to page through each new batch of materials fascinating. These mostly weren't full orchestral scores designed for a conductor's podium in a concert hall. Piano vocal scores were produced so ordinary people, musicians at home, could play the piano and sing their favorite songs from the popular music of the day. There were famous names, of course, works by Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Rossini, and Puccini. But I found the lesser known works more interesting. Here's a gorgeous frontispiece and title page from an 1804 opera by the English tenor and composer John Brown, not Johannes Brahms, his more famous unrelated person. <laughs> more famous, uh, John Brown was more famous as an operatic tenor than a composer. Um, he had a long and storied career, from an orphan boy descant singer at London's Great Synagogue to being the first English male singer to command a continental reputation, England being considered somewhat of a backwater at the time, to a United States tour in the 1840s when he was in his 60s, but it still apparently had a good voice, and is credited then for just increasing American enthusiasm for opera. I suppose that could be good and bad, depending on your opinion of opera. Here's another of the lesser known works from our project, it's Narcissa by Mary Carr Moore. Mary Carr Moore was a composer born in Tennessee in 1873, who moved to the West Coast when she was 10. She studied composition and singing in San Francisco and eventually began teaching and composing music professionally. She moved to Seattle in 1901, where she wrote this opera about the real life of Narcissa Prentice, a missionary and educator who, after her marriage to Dr. Marcus Whitman, became one of the first two European American women to cross the Rocky Mountains. The Whitmans founded a mission at present day Walla Walla and participated in the conflict between new settlers and the native peoples of the Oregon Territory, culminating in what white settlers called the 1847 Whitman Massacre, where both were killed. You may recognize Marcus Whitman's name from Whitman College, among other Pacific Northwest landmarks. The libretto, or the words to the opera, were written by the, the composer's mother, Sarah Pratt Carr, who was a Unitarian minister. The opera portrays Narcissa in her historical role with themes of patriotism and missionary zeal. Narcissa's lack of amorous entanglements in the opera led some contemporary critics to question if it was even opera at all. The opera was premiered at the Moore Theater in Seattle on April 12, 1912, with the composer conducting. In this image, I've blown up the penciled in inscription on our copy that reads, with love for my dear friends, Mary Carmel. I could go on, there are so many gems in this collection, but in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to Justin to talk about the next step in our process, conservation. Thanks, Mariah. I'm happy to share the small part I had to play in this very interesting project. As part of my role as book conservator for the libraries, I would say about a quarter to a third of the books I treat in a given year come from the Rare Scores collection of the Music Library. The goal of which is to preserve access to these collections by ensuring they are in a condition where they can be used, studied, or perhaps even played by our music school students. What is unique about this project is that through digitization, we can broaden that access by providing even greater access to these scores virtually. Of course, preparing them for their virtual debut is not all that unlike preparing them for use in person. One of the things I've always loved about this job is that we are trained from very early on that you can judge a book by its cover. The reality is that you can learn a great deal about a book from its cover. Old books, in particular, have much to tell about their lives and the details of their condition. 
Old books are often prized for being in excellent or mint condition. But from my point of view, those books have never really been prized at all. A prized book to me is a used book, a well-used book. The covers beaten and worn, sometimes with leaves sticking out, or perhaps with leaves pressed within. As well as the evidence of past owner's care and the repairs they may they made to keep their most prized editions alive. One of the things about rare music scores that stick out in my mind is that among our collections are some very well-loved books, and as such are often my favorite treatments. Their lives and use are spelled out much more dramatically and thoroughly than many of their more literary counterparts. Many of the common problems we see with rare scores are tied directly to how they were used. Music is read flat and the binding structures used for music were designed to open and lay flat. And the musicians out there will tell you that this requirement really hasn't changed. Modern scores are almost always printed and bound in structures that are limited in bulk and lay perfectly flat. Unfortunately, over time, this causes major structural breakdown of the books themselves. We often see this not only affecting the sewing structure of the book, but also the exterior covers along the major hinging areas. For the larger works, we see additional problems where traditional elements like end bands and spine decoration deteriorate badly because of the exceptional pressures placed on them to open in a way they were not necessarily designed. The Rare Scores Digitization Project provided a unique opportunity to look at our scores collection slightly differently. We conservators are often looking at objects in light of returning them to a condition so that they may be used by people. However, in this case, we were tasked with evaluating this collection in light of its being photographed within the AT's photography system. As a principle, we try to tailor our treatments with a light hand, only intervening where necessary to ensure future access and longevity of the object. However, to meet the requirements of this project, we had to look at the viability of each object and its ability to not only be used by a person, but also to be efficiently and safely photographed. In a typical case, only the most extreme problems were dealt with. However, because we had to adjust our thinking in light of the AT system and the digitization workflow, we had to accept challenges that we might have otherwise felt were unnecessary in order to safely acquire the desired photography. For example, in this case, we had to be sure leaves would operate and open safely without risk of loss or damage within the AT's apparatus. The binding couldn't really be relied upon to provide the support for the text block needed for the photography process. Thus, re-sewing and binding was required to bring everything back together. The result is a cohesive, flexible, and functioning book ready for photography it also has the renewed strength to hold itself together during digitization. In this example, a broken spine and someone's attempt to glue it back together has resulted in a rather awkwardly functioning opening, which not only makes it difficult to photograph properly, but also poses a great deal of risk to the individual leaves as they are unevenly glued and can tear. In the newly treated book, the entire binding was taken down and the leaves separated, cleared of bad glue, and then individually repaired so it could be re-sewn and rebound. The balanced lay flat opening is restored and the book is ready for photography. In this case, there was no original binding at all, leaving the pages vulnerable, but also making photography difficult and the risk of loss great. As it had not been completely disbound, a lot of residual spine glue and fragments of its original sewing made it unwieldy and likely to tear during digitization. Through treatment, however, it now has a robust foundation for digitization, but also a handsome new binding that will provide greater protection and use into the future. Sometimes a book's past life complicates digitization in other ways. Rather than as a product of deterioration, this final example was problematic because it had previously received a different style. 
of binding not designed for music at all. Instead of a nice flat opening, it was rather restricted and much more suitable for casual reading, as one might read a novel. Gaining access to the full image on the page was extremely difficult. It may be a bit hard to tell, but this book is depicted under significant restriction and still won't open enough to get a clean image of the inner spine area. By removing and re-sewing, along with some careful lining of the spine, we were able to free this book up enough to get a useful image. All in all, this project has been an excellent opportunity for us within the library's preservation department to leverage our overlapping specialties in common cause. Especially unique was the ability to leverage our capabilities to enhance greater access to our collections in more than one way. I remain pleased with the outcome and gratified with what we've been able to achieve. Thanks, Maria. Well, thanks, Justin. Um, as Justin alluded to, we do have specialized digitization equipment in preservation. In these days of carrying around high-powered cameras in our pockets, it seems like anyone can take great pictures. But there are some challenges posed by books and text that don't lend themselves as well to technology that's evolved to capture selfies, Instagram-worthy sunsets, or baby pictures. Our book digitization setup is designed to be as book-friendly as possible and re reinforce this by training each student thoroughly in book handling best practices and ergonomics. As you can see from this image, we use two powerful DLSR cam DSLR cameras so we can take pictures of two pages at once, which makes the whole process go a lot faster. It has LED lighting built in. During image capture, we turn off the lights in the small room so the lighting environment can be consistent and even, no matter if it's sunny or rainy or if the fluorescent bulbs in the hallway are flickering madly. The padded and adjustable cradle holds the book in place with about a 100 degree opening angle. The counterweighted top, clear top platen raises and lowers by hand and encourages pages to lie flat in order to get as clear and consistent an image as possible. Outside of simply getting and keeping the technology up and running, one of the primary challenges I've encountered in digitization is dealing with the irregularities of old books and the expectations of perfection on a screen. In contemporary books, and certainly on our Kindles, we're used to square corners, right angles, and laser jet printing. In this example, you can see that something went amiss and the plate used to print the right hand page is tilted quite a bit out of square. Not to get too bogged down on details, but during the editing of these images, we spent a considerable amount of time deciding whether to crop out the edges of the book or not. I didn't want to hide the materiality of the original books, so we chose to keep the margin and the pages and the cover in nearly every book, which probably made our job more difficult, but I think that additional context is worth it. You never forget that you are looking at something that began life as an analog book. In a digitization project, we spend roughly three times the amount of time editing photos as we do taking them in the first place. Then we spend even more time creating metadata and text files, managing uploads, and troubleshooting issues. But I think all the time and investment pays off. By the end of this project, we had successfully met and even exceeded the ambitions of our original grant. We digitized 52 scores, consisting of almost 10,000 images and over 500 million bytes of digital information. We collaborated across three different departments, the music library, preservation department, and libraries IT, and created a model for future work. Materials were made openly accessible on the Hathi Trust, and the digital files are now preserved there for the long term. Digital information needs to be carefully managed and maintained over time to avoid the dangers of things like software obsolescence. And as I alluded to in the beginning of this talk, the Hathi Trust is one of the safest places available to interest our content to. So let's talk about the impact of digitization projects in general and this work in particular. The very first one, we've said the word a million times during this talk, is increased access. Digitization is often equated with increasing access, but what exactly do we mean by that? In this case, the music library holds a significant collection of rare or unique music scores. We may have the only copy in the region, on the continent, or even in the world. 
or some aspect of a particular copy we have is significant. Say it has annotations or early performance notes or that signature by Mary Carr Moore I mentioned earlier. Barring other methods of access, someone would have to physically travel to our library to see the book that they were interested in. Digitization makes it possible to see the book from anywhere with an internet connection. And even when we do digitize things and put them online, their placement online matters. We've heard that digital collections can be dis difficult for re researchers to discover. They can be buried in databases or on library websites. And there's so much content online that it can be tough to separate the signal from the noise. Depositing our digitized collections with the Hathi Trust helps break down these digital silos by placing the material in a centralized, huge repository where scholars already know where to go. For scholarship, digital collections are a rich pedagogical resource. Our own School of Music courses, including music history and theory, performance and repertoire courses, are now more readily able to integrate these materials into their coursework. They can also be used and reused by scholars, students, and performers around the world. For collaboration, a portion of this collection had been digitized previously, but those projects hadn't formally involved preservation, nor were the digitized books high quality enough to deposit beyond our local repositories. Since those earlier projects, we've really grown our ability as a preservation department to support these kind of projects and are able to contribute expertise, equipment, staff time, and support like never before. This pilot project jump-started efforts to approach the digitization work in a new way, creating new workflows across departments, ultimately benefiting users and the longevity of the materials. So this digitization project centered the preservation, also known as the long-term availability and usability of both the physical originals and the digital sur surrogates. Doing high quality digitization coupled with conservation makes a virtuous cycle. Digitization can be a preservation action, presenting a surrogate for general use that can reduce wear and tear on the original but it can also drive interest in and use of the original objects by making our collections more discoverable by more researchers around the world. Therefore, we have a responsibility to take care of both the physical and the digital object in the best way that we can. And that brings us to the end of the presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us.